The Avengers. That's what we call ourselves. Sort of like a team. Earth's mightiest heroes type thing. Avengers, time to work for a living. That's my secret. I'm always angry. I am on the side of life. You get hurt, hurt them back. You get killed, walk it off. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. I'm your host, Andrew, and I'm here to talk to you about the Avengers. Welcome to episode 78 of Some Assembly Required, your weekly adventure into the annals of Earth's mightiest heroes, the Avengers. This week, we are taking a look at Avengers number 73, The Sting of the Serpent. This week's issue is written by Roy Thomas, pencils by Frank Giacoya and Herb Trimpey, inks by Sam Granger, letters by Art Simic, and it comes to us in February of 1970. Starting off with our cover, the cover image itself implies that Black Panther is fighting on his own against the Sons of the Serpent, not of his choosing, which, as we will find out during the course of this issue, is not really the case. I'm also not very keen on the portion that's in full color, that specifically the portion that features Black Panther, because the inking is a bit heavy on the shadows, and the Sons of the Serpent are somewhat lacking in detail. The rest of the Avengers look great, and I really like the monochromatic color choice. I think it's excellent. And the inking there adds a lot of wonderful depth to the cover. So overall, the cover is kind of a mixed bag, middle of the road. There's some really good and there's some less than good. Now, our issue starts off in a secret hall where we see, speaking from a platform in the form of a viper, the sons of the serpent are back. And they are once again spouting off their venomous, hate-soaked speech. So we really waste no time in introducing the villains for this issue. The Sons of the Serpent are back, and they are once again playing at those same themes of xenophobia and racism that they embraced so much back in issues 32 and 33. One little thing that we do add to the mythos of the Sons of the Serpent is we get an explanation of where they derive their name, but it seems like a very odd perversion of the story of Adam and Eve because they talk about the serpent driving out Adam and Eve from paradise. And while from a certain perspective that is true, that's not really the standard accepted perspective, right? The serpent wasn't the, the driving force. It was the choice made by Adam and Eve that was enabled by the serpent. Again, it just goes to show how this organization takes and twists and perverts things to fit their narrative of the situation. Now, this opening scene ends pretty quickly, and we then find ourselves on the other side of the ocean where Black Panther is making his way from his ancestral homeland of Wakanda to his newly adopted residence in New York. Now, little does Black Panther suspect that while he is convincing himself that very little is likely to have changed. A terrorist bomb is tearing its way through a New York high-rise, and this particular high-rise was chosen because it contained an Equal Employment Opportunity Office. Equal Employment Opportunity obviously deals with employment of various minority groups and ensuring that they have equal access, equal opportunity to various forms of employment. It prevents discrimination in the workplace. So it's, it's a fairly clear uh, choice of targets for our villains. Now, what I like here is the internal conflict we see within Black Panther. In a lot of ways, he is a man who is still very much trying to define his place in the world. He has a wonderful sense of who he is, but not necessarily how that person fits into the greater scheme of the universe. And watching him puzzle out these ideas and trying to figure out what his role in the greater society really is. Is it King T'Challa? Is it Black Panther? Is it in Wakanda? Is it in New York? Those are very interesting questions for this character. Again, because this character does, I think, know himself very well in terms of what he stands for and what he believes in. It's just a question of where do I take that? What's the next step? So as firefighters and paramedics descend on the catastrophe that is this bombing, some of them find a strange serpent staff near the ruined building. Obviously, only one organization could be behind this attack and would have left this particular calling card. Shortly thereafter, a local African-American television host, Montague Hale, demands that 
the bombing be investigated as the terrorist attack that it very obviously is. After making this broadcast on his way home, Hale is attacked by the Sons of the Serpent. Now, for an organization with such lofty goals, the Sons use really very pedestrian methods of trying to make that change. On one hand, it serves to demonstrate really the true standing of the organization that espouses these ideals. They are effectively thugs, and they act like thugs. The flip side of that is that they have very advanced technology, and they're fairly obviously well-financed, so it's odd that a group with technology and financing and things would tend to stoop to mob violence and to general thug-like behavior. I also, I like the pacing of this opening section because it moves very quickly, but it gets all of the important material out of the way and then gets us on to really the meat of the story. Now, it does have the drawback that it is a bit tougher to follow, especially if you're not very familiar with narrative graphic storytelling. Having said that, it's not so hard as to preclude someone from following it. It's just not as straightforward as, say, the next couple of pages that are very standard panel layouts. There are some uniquely done things, especially on the last panel where Montague Hale is actually attacked, where you've got the Sons of the Serpent preparing to attack Hale. We then see Hale on the ground, and behind in the background we see a newspaper talking about the attack. So really, you have three to four moments of this attack all wrapped up into one panel, and it takes a moment to kind of wrap your brain around it, but it's a very well done panel. As a result of the ensuing controversy from Hale's attack, his show is cancelled. And in the wake of this firing, Hale is invited on as the guest of a rival show, the Dan Dunn Show, which is hosted by the very obviously bigoted Dan Dunn, who is a fairly stereotypical blonde hair white guy. As the two men begin to debate, the exchange gets fairly heated and they trade barbs, but Dunn quickly cuts Hale off and introduces Monica Lynn, who is a very attractive young African-American singer, who then performs on the show. When her performance is complete, Dunn invites the young woman to join the debate, and although she joins the pair, she really declines to participate in the conversation, which frustrates Hale quite a bit and provides Dunn with some very thinly veiled pleasure. After the taping is complete and Lynn and Hale are departing the studio, attempts to convince Lynn to be more politically active and to fight discrimination, but Lynn really wants nothing to do with this cause. Unfortunately, little does Miss Lynn know that the Sons of the Serpent have already set their sights on her. So Dan Dunn is such a blatant scumbag. It really is difficult to think that someone could be like this, especially like a television host. And then I started flipping through cable news again. And, you know, it's a lot less hard than I thought it was going to be. His tactics are so obvious and yet so inflammatory. And all he does is ignores the claims that Hale makes and refuses to acknowledge any viewpoint but his own. And there are just so many news organizations out there that do this now that at first, like I said, it, it was very easy for me to go, oh, this guy is just, it's a caricature. He can't exist. And then I went, oh, no, no, wait, there's a lot of these guys. And that's kind of frustrating and disappointing, I, I really have to admit, to come to that realization. I also find that Monica Lynn is a very odd character to add, although they make good use of her throughout the issue. Issue, it's very bizarre to have this singer on what appears to be some kind of political show. Especially when on top of that, when she's not there to debate, she's very laissez-faire about what's going on. And all she has come on the show to do really is plug her career. And when she's offered the chance to take a stand, to join in the conversation, she's very casual about it and she takes a pass. One of the things I really like about this last little section, though, is that once you realize that the Suns have a plan going against Miss Lynn, you can look back a few panels and see what appear to be lookouts waiting for her to pass in order to give information to those lying in wait for her. You can see what appears to be an ambush being set. When we get to Avengers Mansion, we find that the heroes have assembled themselves in order to address this situation, because again, they have a history with the Sons of the Serpent. But before they truly get started, Yellow Jacket takes a few minutes to fill in Vision on the team's previous encounter with 
these hate mongers with the Sons of the Serpent. And Yellow Jacket relays the tale of how, following an attack on Pym's assistant Bill Foster, Captain America was captured by the Sons of the Serpent. The Avengers were forced to make public statements in support of the Sons in order to get Cap back. And initially, Hank Pym agrees, but when he takes the stage, he instead chooses to denounce the group, at which point the Avengers are confronted by an imposter Captain America, while the real Cap is rescued by Hawkeye and Black Widow. And in the end, the Supreme Serpent is determined to be a foreign general who is attempting to sow dissent within the American populace. As this is going on, the Avengers are trying to figure out what the Sons of the Serpent's next move is going to be. Unfortunately, that move is already underway. So in all seriousness here, I do not need a two-page recap of what happened. I get it was 40 issues ago, but two pages of recap is just a lot of page space for a flashback that can literally be found in another issue. If we had a flashback to some other time or some other encounter that we haven't seen in the comics, great, I'll, I'll work with you on that one. But a two-page recap of a previous issue is excessive and a waste of page space. The only redeeming quality that this section has is that it is at least good-looking comics. So as a result, I can at least enjoy reading it and looking at it from an aesthetic point of view, even if I don't think it serves much of a purpose in the actual story. In a park near where she was dropped off by Montague Hale, Monica Lynn is attacked by several men robed in the garb of the Sons of the Serpent. And just as her assailants are about to murder her really in cold blood, they are thankfully interrupted by the timely intervention of Black Panther. Although he manages to draw the attention of the Sons of the Serpent, Black Panther is unable to immediately defeat the Sons and is forced into a quick retreat, but is able to attack once again before the Sons of the Serpent really have a chance to regroup, so he catches them off guard. At this point, the outcome, although not guaranteed to be in Black Panther's favor, is at least now in doubt, and the Supreme Serpent who has been watching remotely, chooses to kill his followers rather than let them be beaten by Black Panther. Finally, the police arrive on scene, and it becomes very clear that the attack was racially motivated, and that this experience has shaken Miss Lin out of her political apathy. So to start, this is a very interesting decision for the Sons of the Serpent to make. When the Sons attacked Montague Hale, they made it clear that they only wanted to hurt him, really to make an example of him and to teach others. Now they are openly willing to kill Miss Lynn, who is at least a minor public figure as well as Montague Hale. And I'm very curious about what is driving this change. In general, I would say that when comparing these various crimes, assaults and beatings don't tend to spur the same degree of public outcry unless they reach a particular level of heinous. Murders, on the other hand, are far more likely to bring about public ire. So for an organization that is trying to bring people to their method of thought, their ideology, murder seems to be a very counterproductive choice. Now, there is a certain degree to which instilling fear will drive a population to take certain actions, and that murder does tend to drive that fear, especially if it's a very showy or very public kind of murder. But at the same time, an action like that is almost equally likely, if not more, to spark public outcry and to drive the citizenry away from that ideology and look towards its downfall. So I'm curious what has caused the Sons of the Serpent to try and play this particular gamble. When Black Panther is fighting these Sons of the Serpent, he's making great use of motion and he's an excellent judge of the situation. By constantly keeping his opponents off balance, he's able to get the upper hand at least against three men who would otherwise have taken him down. Three on one, those aren't terrible odds, but they're not great odds. So the fact that Black Panther is able to dissect the situation and take action to give himself the best opportunity really says a lot about how tactically minded he is and how intelligent he is. Once Black Panther has that upper hand though, I think the Supreme Serpent might be acting a little rashly by killing his minions 
so callously, but it also shows how deeply held his beliefs are and that he would be willing to kill his own men before letting them be beaten by someone he feels is inferior. Again, this goes back to the motivation of the driving force behind things. Are they following the Supreme Serpent because they're afraid of him or are they doing it because they're devoted to him? And if they're already afraid of him, then killing isn't such a bad thing. If they're devoted to him and he starts needlessly killing, that may undermine that devotion. And if it doesn't cross that line into fear, you may start to see some negative consequences within the organization. Lastly, I think the creative team really nails Monica Lynn's response, especially when the police show up. She has exactly the right amount of rage and horror and is swinging between emotions as her brain is trying to come off of this adrenaline rush. It is very convincing that she is the victim of someone who has just undergone a significant trauma and that it's having an effect on her. Following the attack, the Avengers tune in to the next episode of Dan Dunn's show, and both Lynn and Hale have returned as guests, and Lynn explains her recent experience, but Dunn is quick to dismiss that the idea that race had anything to do with the attack, and this again causes tempers to flare. Now, the way Dunn controls this situation, it really starts to seem like he is in some way, shape, or form in on what's happening because he dismisses these events so easily and it really feels like he is playing a part in a script. That it wouldn't matter what Miss Lynn said, this is how Dan Dunn would respond because this is how he's been told to respond. So at this point, the readers really start to get a feeling that, you know, Dunn is probably one of the serpents or is in some way closely affiliated with the serpents. At this point, the situation in Avengers Mansion also begins to heat up as the team decides that the time has come for their involvement. Unfortunately, Black Panther disagrees in part because he demands to take on the Sons of the Serpent on his own. Eventually, his teammates reluctantly agree, but they also wonder if one person, even one who is as capable as Black Panther, is really up to this challenge. So I get why Black Panther feels the need to go out and do this himself, but I have a difficult time understanding why the Avengers go with it. It's a little hypocritical of Black Panther to want to do this, given that not all that long ago, Black Panther specifically was the one who would not allow Hawkeye to go after Black Widow because he was too close to the situation. It was too personal for Hawkeye. So he had to be left behind and the other Avengers went after what they thought was Black Widow. Now Black Panther finds himself in a similar instance, makes a very similar choice to the one that Hawkeye was trying to make. In fact, in some ways he takes it a step further by insisting that only he can go as opposed to just being a part of the Avengers team. And yet he sees nothing wrong with this. Now, maybe it's one of those things where you just determine you have to do something. And although you internally recognize that there is a conflict with what you have done, said in the past, generally what you believe, this is kind of an overriding feeling or emotion, and you just have to act on it. That is a possibility. Unfortunately, we don't really get an explanation, and it ends up coming off as slightly hypocritical. So after making contact with Monica Lynn to explain his mission, Black Panther begins to hunt the Sons of the Serpent. And after Black Panther finds several members of the Sons of the Serpent out on a mission, he discreetly incapacitates one of their men and quietly takes his place. Now Black Panther here is totally creeping on Monica Lynn, which is probably not the best idea given that what she's just been through and that PTSD is a real thing. I honestly wouldn't be entirely surprised if she had gone off on Black Panther or broken down, something to that effect based on the way he approaches her, which is very surprising to her. Now here, I really love, and I mean love, the panels of Black Panther stalking through Manhattan. It is such great imagery, leaving everything in silence. Silence is so often underestimated or forgotten in comics, 
And this page uses it to just wonderful effect, especially because the reality of this scene is that it would have played out in near silence. So it really helps to put the reader in the middle of what is going on. I don't need to hear Black Panther's inner monologue. I can see what's going on. And through his actions, his thoughts are very clear. While I am sure there is plenty of other inner monologue going on, it's not essential to the storytelling and it doesn't need to be conveyed to the reader. So finally, as the men return from the mission, they are confronted by a sentry who demands that they recite the Serpent's Oath. While his comrades are very well versed in this passcode, Black Panther is unable to finish his portion of the oath when it comes to his turn, and he's quickly revealed and captured by the Sons of the Serpent. And the issue concludes with the voice of the Supreme Serpent booming out over the intercom, making it very clear that the whole situation was a setup in order to obtain the last crucial piece that will make their plan successful, which is Black Panther himself. I have to admit that in the end, although it's a really cool to watch Black Panther infiltrate the Sons of the Serpent, it's probably not his best plan. The idea of trying to infiltrate a racist organization as one of the minorities that they are against is pretty obviously likely to fail. Now, I do like the fact that it actually turns out to be part of the Sons' plan, but I would struggle to find someone who didn't see at least part of this turn of events coming. The idea that Black Panther was going to get caught. Even in the, the Sons of the Serpent costume, he's not all that convincing because he still has his costume on under their uniform. So it just doesn't quite work out and it's pretty obvious that he's going to get caught. So overall, this was a really great setup for the next issue. The issue does a wonderful job of laying out the current situation and beginning to build up the suns as being truly insidious and cancerous, looking to find root at the, the heart of American society. And this issue, this book really sells that to the reader. What strikes me the most from this issue, though, is that as amazingly poignant as the last appearance of the Sons of the Serpent was. And it, it was extremely poignant given the world events in Charlottesville, Virginia, just as I was covering those issues. Monica Lynn's political apathy in this issue is so spot on. So often we see people who just don't care about a problem because they aren't affected by it. And watching Miss Lynn's change due to those things that happened to her, and in this case, Miss Lynn's change is due to things that happen, again, to her. So very much in a way, she never really stops being focused on herself. It's just that this new belief overlaps with a more altruistic worldview. Because she was attacked, she now cares about preventing attacks. And it's so often the case that when something doesn't affect a person, they almost can't be bothered with it. That really is a profound political statement. It was a profound political statement in 1970, and it's still a profound political statement today. The problems have changed in some regards and are unfortunately the same in other regards, but the fundamental principle that people don't care about what doesn't affect them is still one of the biggest problems and one of the most fundamental causes of all these other problems. You know, racism and, and hate and things like that, violence against minorities, discrimination, those kinds of societal evils would not be a concern if people would just care about things that didn't necessarily affect them. Them, but affected the person next to them, affected their fellow man. So much more could be done in the world. So much good could occur. So much could be better if we would just take that little step and care about something other than us. Remember, you can find us at AvengersAssembly.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can find this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Next week, we are going to be taking a look at Avengers number 74, Pursue the Panther. All right, hey. All right, good job, guys. Uh, let's just not come in tomorrow. Let's just take a day. Have you ever tried shawarma? There's a shawarma joint about two blocks from here. I don't know what it is, but I want to try it.